Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'll be talking with Frank Capillary of Cap Thesis. We'll see what sort of charts he's looking at. Noisy day in the markets, to be honest with you. Sort of a V-shaped contour to the action today. Selling off through the uh, early afternoon, but a nice rally overall into the close with the S&P and the Nasdaq finishing in the green. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of technical analysis, the technical toolkit, which I've learned over the course of my career, continue to learn about, really empowers you to understand investor psychology and make better decisions, decisions by respecting the dynamics of the, uh, of the market. The market moves, price movements occur because of the interplay between supply and demand, between fear and greed. When we have earnings going on, we have news flow, inflation data, uh, debt ceilings, all these different narratives to try to make sense of. At the end of the day, price is fact, as my uh, one of my mentors, Ralph Acampora, famously said. And by focusing on the movements in price, we can really understand how investors are excited, nervous, desperate, euphoric, panicked. All of that is arguably reflected in uh, price action. With that as an introduction, let's get to today's price action. Really a lot of reaction relative to the inflation number that came out this morning. Let's look at what the charts tell us about the uh, dynamics today. Major averages finishing sort of mixed, although there was a big improvement in the, uh, in the uh, afternoon hours to push the S&P and the Nasdaq back toward the highs of the day. The S&P finished today just below 4140. That's up just about a half a percent from yesterday's close, although earlier in the day it was actually in the red, but a nice recovery in the afternoon. The Nasdaq composite opened strong, weakened in the middle of the day, and then finished strong once again, uh, again, up only about 1%. But a nice recovery from our early sell-off, which, which felt like the initial uh, reaction to inflation was overextended. Uh, uh, but a nice recovery, again, finishing near the highs, just above 12300 The Dow flat, and again, what you have to remember about the Dow industrials, it's not really just industrials, right? It's a mix of sort of blue-chip mega-cap names, and some of the areas of the Dow are certainly uh, struggling relative to others. Mid-caps and small-caps both up as well, but the NASDAQ, the strongest out of all of the indexes I just mentioned. One of the things in the red today is the VIX, moving back to the downside, back below 17. Now, that's been sort of a characteristic of the markets in 2023, is we've seen lower volatility, right? Uh, 2022, markets sell off overall going into the October low, elevated volatility with the VIX well above 20 for most of the year. That changed in the fourth quarter into the beginning of 2023. And now we have the VIX remaining well below 20, again, pushing back below uh, 17. Let's look at some other asset classes here very quickly and see where things netted out. The yield curve overall moving down with the 10-year yield uh, down about eight points to uh, 344, we'll call it. Uh, the long bond yield just around 3.8%. Again, the short end of the curve is still pretty elevated relative to the rest of the curve. This is where the Fed actually changing rates really has the most direct impact. The rest of this is more about the market forces pricing in you know, future economic growth or, uh, or stagnation. And you can see that interest rates uh, overall pushing to the downside. When rates are going lower, bond prices are moving higher. And through the course of the day, the TLT finished higher about 1%. The dollar index, not much of a change from... Uh, from yesterday. Commodities, again, pretty noisy day all around. Gold actually opened higher, sold off earlier. You can see on our little two-day preview chart what a movement there was. Uh, early afternoon, it was basically flat for the day. Finished a little bit weaker, but overall, sort of a lot of noise. Uh, and at the end of the day, netting out to not much of a change from yesterday. Silver prices a little bit lower. Copper prices much lower. Crude oil prices lower as well. And the energy sector was the worst performer out of the 11 S&P sectors here today. Finishing off with cryptocurrencies, again, very noisy. By now, as, as we're going live with the show, Bitcoin actually just below 27700 That's pretty much where we were yesterday uh, at uh, you know, sort of the end of the 24-hour period. Can't really say the close because these trade 24 hours. But just like with currencies, we think about a daily closing value as sort of the daily reset 
Um, so it's uh, pretty much flat over the last to, you know, 10, 12 hours or so is how I would describe it. Ether prices, same thing, holding steady around 1850. Let's look at the sector movements here very quickly and just talk about what happened. Sort of a growthy top to the list, but very quickly turns into defense. So before you go saying, all right, great, this is a big, huge exclamation point bull market kind of move, hold that thought because REITs and utilities were the second and third top performing sectors. And again, let's not draw any long-term conclusions from short-term data. But again, by reviewing these sort of uh, daily returns on the sector ETFs, you can get a sense of where the trends are evolving over time. And a trend, a pattern of defensive sectors at the top of the list or at the bottom of the list can tell you a little bit about the overall dynamics at work here. So technology number one, and again, if you ask me to randomly pick some of the strongest names, chances are I'd end up in the technology sector somewhere. If not technology, maybe communication services, uh, maybe something like a home builders, maybe a gold stock. I don't know where exactly I would uh, I would net out, but technology would be a pretty good uh, pretty good bet there. Up 1.2%, that's for the XLK. Real estate and utilities were second and third, followed closely by communication services. At the bottom of the list, four sectors finished in the red, and the three at the bottom, energy, financials, industrials, are a bit of a concern. These are some of the cyclical uh, sectors. And what's interesting is, if when I was uh, scanning earlier today for stocks making new three-month highs and three-month lows, I saw a handful in energy, but a lot of those are not to a new three-month low yet. They're just sort of trading around uh, just above those lows, but a lot of new lows in financials and a bunch in the industrial sector as well. So I was not surprised by the end of the day to see those sectors at the bottom of the list as well. Let's look at a daily chart of the S&P 500. I'm going to bump out the uh, big, thick green trend line that we've been watching here for a little while because this is the 4200 level. And it's, and it's amazing how much we have these day-to-day -day movements. Every day we recap what happened during the trading day and then try to connect the short-term information we just gained with the longer-term trends. And again, I keep coming back to the consistency of this consolidation period, right? For the last six weeks now, maybe a little bit more, we've been range bound between basically 4050 and 4200, right? 4050, these are the lows uh, in late April, early May, right around the 50 day moving average, which is currently just above 4050. On the upper end, we have 4200. That was the February peak. This was the peak about a week and a half ago. And once again, we're sort of chopping around between these two levels. So in this sort of environment, the good news is it's most likely not gonna do this forever. At some point, uh, either buyers take control or sellers take control. And that's a you know, sort of a shorthand way to describe what the dynamics actually are. There's an even number of buyers and sellers at any given moment. It's more, does buying power, the demand for shares outweigh the supply that's out there is a way that I think is, is maybe more, a little more accurate, a little more closely related to what it is. Is there enough demand? Is there enough people willing to pay more and more for things that they're able to push or, and willing to push the price higher? That's what gets us above 4,200. When people start getting nervous and they start taking profits in unwinding positions, that's the selling pressure, the seller domination that I'm talking about. So one of those two things is going to happen. I would be very closely watching those two. I have alerts set for when the S&P gets above 4,200 or gets below 4,050. I think that will be a key alert to set and forget and just make sure you review it. Because while the S&P is choppy sideways, there are a lot of individual stocks and groups and themes that are certainly moving just fine to one way, uh, one way or the other. I want to go briefly here to what we call the new Dow theory. When I'm looking at my list of equity indexes, uh, Dow theory is Charles Dow's original design of looking at the Dow industrials and the Dow transports. The benefit of that is that is really uh, how uh, Charles Dow originally envisioned it, looking at the Dow industrials and the Dow uh, railroads, which has now become the Dow transports. But I think a 2023 edition of that probably is better served by looking at the S&P 500, which is the top half of the chart, and the NASDAQ composite, which is the bottom half of the chart. As of today, with the rally, with the markets finishing stronger going toward the close, with uh, technology leading the way higher, and with some of the mega cap names like Alphabet and Microsoft and others doing just fine, this is pushing the NASDAQ composite arguably to a new swing high for the year, making a new 52-week closing high today. The S&P, as you can see, is not quite there. So here's what happens, right? Back in February, late January, early February, both of these indexes made a new swing high. I would argue that is a new Dow Theory buy signal where both the S&P and the NASDAQ make a new swing high. That is a bull-confirmed pattern. 
We don't have that yet. What that tells me is the S&P needs to get above 4,200, basically, to break out of this range, confirm what we've already seen from the NASDAQ composite. If that would not happen for any reason, this would be a, a non-confirmation or a bearish non-confirmation, which could be a concerning uh, pattern if you're bullish and you're just waiting for the market to go higher. I would keep a wary eye on the S&P and, again, just reinforcing the importance of not just trading up to a resistance level, but trading through it uh, to the upside. I recorded a video for my YouTube channel earlier, earlier today talking about uh, this chart, and I po posted on social media as well. You know, DuPont is a fantastic example of what we call the head and shoulders pattern. It's so brilliantly ideal that I'm going to spend a half, a half a minute here and just show you how ideal it is. I actually saved, uh, here we go, saved the example just so you can see what's going on here. A head and shoulders pattern, of course, a high surrounded by two lower highs. The neckline is just gently sloping higher, which is right out of the Edwards and McGee sort of Bible of technical analysis telling you about this fundamental uh, price pattern in the technical toolkit. We break the neckline after bouncing off of there in late April. Over the last uh, couple of weeks, we've now gapped below that level. And by breaking below that neckline, we confirm this head and shoulders pattern, right? This lower high tells you to start getting concerned. The fact that we're testing support at the neckline is another cause for concern. We're below a downward sloping 50-day moving average, and then we break below that. And what that suggests is that the downtrend is most likely not over. The minimum measuring technique would be taking the height of the pattern and subtracting that from the breakdown, which puts us down sort of in that 57, 58 range or so, depending on exactly how you want to measure it. But interesting to see within the material sector, DuPont actually having a classic uh, head and shoulders topping pattern here. Interesting gap higher. We had Jay Woods uh, on the show yesterday from the floor of the NYSE, which was a lot of fun to chat with him there. But, uh, you know, a brilliant technical analyst and getting some of the charts he was looking at. We talked about some individual names that were gapping related to earnings. I have to point out Akamai Technology gapping up to its 200-day moving average. Now, there are a number of stocks that have been below the 200-day for quite some time. Amazon comes to mind as a great example of that as well. It's been below the 200-day for over a year. All of a sudden, over the last couple of weeks, finally getting above the 200-day, which could be the beginning of something much more meaningful. Does Akamai follow Amazon's suit and continue to push higher? It's all about if we can follow through on today's gap to the upside. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with Frank Capillary of Cap Thesis. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It is such a pleasure to be doing this show for you every day after the close. We have a great team here at StockCharts TV helping us do so. We have a great guest today, Frank Capillary. We're going to bring him on here in a few moments. But before we get there, I want to make a couple brief announcements. First off, our mailbag is empty. Won't you help us fill up our mailbag with your questions? You can email us at thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, and we are on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'd love to hear from you, and we'll hope to answer your question live on the air on Friday's show. Upcoming schedule tomorrow on May 11th, we have Clint Cowles. Clint is a longtime strategist at TD Ameritrade, now part of the uh, Schwab family. He'll be coming to us from Minneapolis. Next week on Tuesday, May 16th, excited to announce our next in-person, uh, in-studio guest, Danielle Shea of Simpler Trading, will be in town. She'll be coming through and uh, recording our show live from the studio on Tuesday the 16th. On Wednesday the 17th, Jesse Felder, editor of The Felder Report. I want to bring on today's guest, Frank Capillary. Frank's the founder and president of Cap Thesis, coming to us from the New York area. Frank, great to see you. How are you? Hey, Dave, doing great. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. It was good to see you and many others at the CMT Symposium in New York uh, not too long ago. What a great gathering. And you were among many of, uh, of the people I was super excited to, uh, to be around uh, in person once again. Uh, so I'm glad that you were. I'm glad that you were there, and uh, I appreciate you bringing some charts, really, to help us put things into context. It's been a noisy market. It's been an uncertain market. We're looking at your first daily chart of the S and P. Talk us through what you're seeing here. Well, Dave, you know I had training as a sales trader for 16 years before this, and as I was focused on the short term, it's first thing, and so I continued to look at that as a guide first, because as you know, you can get a clue for longer term trends developing, and the most important thing about the short term intraday work is how the close uh, how the market closes and this just shows all the activity year to date for the s p 500 so the blue hours just simply show the times when the s p not only closed above its midpoint but closed near its highs so the majority of the time that has happened except for that time from mid-february to mid-march and highlighted in there are 16 trading days of which only three times did the s p close at its highs right so just looking at that paying attention to those trends 
we made to realize that we were not ready for a material shift just yet. Obviously, that changed when the market started to rally and bottom. But you can see from that point, again, vast majority of those upswings, we had closes on the highs. So looking for that type of change what could help us really think about the next downturn or at least character change. And that brings us really to the last two weeks of action where, you know, finally had a big down day after about, you know, a month of not having one and the back and forth movement. And so it's really been half and half over the last two or three weeks. And needless to say, we've also had a sideways market because of that. So the good news is that that is yet to do anything more than just move sideways. Yes, maybe the positive momentum has been worn out. Some of the sentiment readings that we like to look at, you know, are near the extremes, not really at the extremes, but that just gives the market a cause for a pause here. And I think best case scenario, of course, is that you have a high level consolidation that does not lead to a material pullback of what we've been used to over the last, uh, of course, almost a year and a half now. That is such a cool chart. And I love the way you've indicated that, you know, and basically telling the story of candlestick analysis, right? You just look at the open candles, you see how often we close during the highs of the day, particularly at the lows in March. Look at this cluster of days sort of closing near the highs. Shows that, you know, short term demand. That's a brilliant illustration of that, Frank. I appreciate it. Your second chart, getting into a theme we've talked about, which is the relationship between sort of the uh, cap weighted versus equal weighted measures of trend. Talk us through what you're seeing on chart number two. Right. Well, I think a lot of times, you, recently, of course, we've heard large cap versus you know small caps, actually regional banks, but you just see the same relationship here, but just within the S&P 500 itself. And this is a pretty big bifurcation of trend here, where the S&P, as you pointed out before, Dave, is very close to potentially breaking out of 4200 area, where the RSP equal weight ETF is just trying to break through a downtrend line, right? So it looks like two totally different charts from that angle. So, you know, we can break this down any way we want, but I think what this really shows us is that there are, of course, stocks that have been doing well. In this particular case, those happen to be larger cap names. So mm. I also asked this question to Twitter yesterday, which one's telling the truth? And the commentary is continuing to go now. You know, there's a lot of arguments about what it means. So I just, I think it tells you it's representative of a sideways market that has been giving head fakes every so often. It's also, you know, giving some confusing messages from a sentiment standpoint. So I think the bottom line is, you know, we need to identify, of course, where the relative strength is. In this particular case, the relative strength is with the larger cap names, right? That could change at any point. Now, two last points about this chart is that I, I, all that being said, I still can't see, say, the S&P moving in one way and the RSP going down the other side. So I think mm -hmm. that tells us at some point there's going to be, say, a mean reversion of this difference between the two. So that could mean that large caps come down to where the, the not so large are doing, or maybe you see some of the other sectors finally see some relief and play catch up to the S&P 500. Mm, sure yeah, that, I, I love that. It's such a it's a great illustration of just the, the 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 difference in the trend between the two. And if you think of the market as just the S and P, you kind of have one set of I guess one observation. But if you look at the equal weighted version, very very different picture. Let's bring in a little more data. Your next chart is looking at a ratio, but looking at the monthly time frame. So bringing in more, what does this tell us? How does this help us understand the trends now? Right. So I think this is a very interesting perspective because it looks at the action all the way since when the RSP ETF um, started back in early 2000s. It doesn't quite get all the internet bubble there, but the, what happened afterward. And I was really surprised to see the complete underperformance of large cap names up until 2015, right? So mm -hmm. talking about more than 20 years worth, again, some, some instances where you had some bounces along the way. And so really what we had highlighted here is maybe you're not in the beginning stages, but maybe the early stages of large cap actually coming back right from that big trend. I'm talking about multi-decades here, of course. But the other part is that, you know, this looks very extended now. Of course, some of the regional banks weakness and whatever has had an effect on it. But if you look at the monthly RSI on the bottom there, Dave, that's just really above, you know, around 60 or so which is a vast difference compared to what we saw at the end of 2019 into COVID when that was the monthly RSI was extremely overbought for multiple months. And that was really when things had overheated. So compared to that time frame, we're not nearly as extreme as we were back then. So maybe this could, again, after a short-term pullback, maybe this just means that large caps could stand to outperform for longer than they have so far already. 
I feel like so many of us are just so comfortable with this narrative that if, you know, if large caps are outperforming, it's not a good thing because small caps, the, the other names need to be in there. I mean, can the market, let's just set the record straight, right? Can the market go higher and have the large caps be dominating? Is that, is that a reasonable expectation from this point on? We've seen it before. <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't have to, you know, I think that the, the notion is that when that ends, it's going to crash the entire market, mm. right? So what the other part, point is that, you know, maybe the ones that haven't been doing well, you could see a rotation back into them. And of course, that's what happened from the, at the end of last year, really, the, and large cap didn't start to outperform really, Dave, as you know, until the beginning of this year, but you had a very big rally in the market overall from, you know, the October lows to the end of December. So we've seen both ways the market can actually do well. Let's dig into a couple of particular sectors and groups. We're going to start with communication services, certainly some of the top charts year to date, Meta and others in this sector. What do you see on the chart of the XLC, encouraging or discouraging at this point? Well, I think if you're looking for a picture perfect, a long-term inverse head and shoulders pattern, this is it right here, right? Whether it works out or not, this is a type of thing where, you know, you would see in a textbook, of course. I think it's also interesting that that neckline lines up with the 38.2 point retracement of the entire decline. Now, XLC in particular, I think is important. Now, it doesn't have much as high a weight, of course, as technology does, mm -hmm. but it has some of the bigger names in there. Like you mentioned, uh, uh, Meta and also the Alphabet and Netflix, right? And Meta especially is is important because, you know, that was one of the biggest ones that started the rollover back in September 2021, took the XLC down with it about two or three months before the S&P did as well. And it was one of the biggest ones that come back of course, uh, over the last number of months. And so right now, I believe that this is a leading indicator of what the, what the large cap growth can do or will be doing, and also the S&P 500 as an extension of that. It's because of its ability to form this potential large base before any others have, right? So we can, you, can, you can identify other bases like this, but this one's not as clear as this right now. So I think if this continues to work the way it should, and we see a breakout that's extended, is that going to be a very good indication that the market can follow along and vice versa, of course. If, if we know make through that resistance point, it's going to be, I think, tough for the rest of the market to do so as well. I feel like this show has turned, today's show has turned into a masterclass on head and shoulders, tops and bottoms between your chart <laughs> of the XLC and my DuPont chart. I think we covered pretty much everything here. Uh, you're welcome, Edwards and McGee, for, for uh, continuing <laughs> to promote that, uh, that pattern. Let's get to our next one's biotech. Biotech and area, you know, healthcare is it's one of those sort of hit or miss sectors. Right? So there's been some really stronger parts, some weaker parts. Do you like what you're seeing in biotech and what would you need to see further from what we've seen so far? Well, we've seen biotech start and stop before, and I've been tracking this for a long time. And you know, it's really underperformed XOV and S&P 500 for a long time, as you can see on that bottom chart there with the XBI versus XOV. And so, on a short-term basis, again, looking at that first, you start to see this moving up a little bit here and there. We, you know, again, we can't see it in this chart in particular, but tracking the daily uh, price action, it's finally had a breakout. It's finally getting toward a target, and so. You know, those smaller patterns that work end up becoming the building blocks potentially for larger foundations to be built, which is exactly what XBI needs to do, improve. So it's potentially made a very important higher low here. If it can continue, of course, you can see it getting back up to those high 90s, 100 area, right? And, you know, the best, best case scenario, of course, is that as it does this, it's also reflected on a relative basis versus the healthcare ETF as well, which is getting close to so again, this is another one that I think is an interesting spot because it doesn't really act like healthcare and you can't really call it, it's not real technology, of course, but I do think it is the epitome of a speculative growth area that needs to come back, which had topped, you know, the beginning of 2021 with so many others, but this one arguably has done better and has more in, you know, components that could possibly come back than say some of the components that are, are stuck in the likes of of the ARC ETF or something much more speculative. So this is a, if nothing else, I think this is an indicator of what we can see happen from other growth areas that the XBI continues to work the way it has been. It's so interesting how the major averages, you feel like sort of stalling out at resistance. And a lot of these groups like biotech, nice short-term improvement, but not quite enough you know, to get to, to, to sort of get above and, and uh, push it to the next level. We only have about 30 seconds left, Frank, but I'd love to just ask you this question. You, in one 10-minute uh, discussion, you've had a daily chart, a monthly chart. You've talked about the short term, the long term. Can you just tell everyone why that, um, you know, thinking about the relationship of those different timeframes is important in your process? 
Well, I think it's important because if you just look at one area, you're, you're missing opportunities elsewhere, right? Mm. And again, not everyone is going to trade every time frame, but at the same time, knowing what is there can help you along the way as well. And again, I think the XBI is, is, a, is a good indication of that because if you look at this from a, you know, a very broad point of view, we would say there's nothing really to do here until it gets back to that resistance point. But you're talking about a big percentage move along the way. And looking at this in a more you know, focused basis, you can identify smaller patterns. And if they break out, play them, or at the very least keep track of them to build your conviction as the, the bigger base potentially builds. That is so well said, Frank. Listen, thanks for bringing some charts with you. Thanks for talking through your perspective. And thanks for uh, you know, doing, doing your best to uh, promote the world of technical analysis. We appreciate it. Be well and stay safe there. We'll talk to you again soon, all right? Thanks so much, Dave. It's my pleasure. That's Frank Capillary. Frank's the founder and president of Cap Thesis, coming to us from the New York area. He recently just started a new technical analysis newsletter for Barron's. I would encourage you to check it out. If you go to barrons.com, you can sign it up as part of the daily newsletter. He is going to be putting something out, I think, every Sunday uh, to focus on some of the technical themes. Frank's awesome. I've known him and uh, followed his work for a long time. I would encourage you to check that out for sure. We need to wrap the show up now. Go to the three and three. Three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment here is chart number one. In our market recap, we talked about what we call the new Dow theory. And I love coming back to this chart. You know, it reminds me of my, my conversations with Frank about looking at some of the short term action, but then think about the longer term, think about the ratios and the relative performance uh, over time of large cap versus small cap or cap weighted versus equal weighted. And thinking about how the transition over time really tells you something about the character of the market and how that might be changing. When I'm looking at new Dow theory, it's with that same sort of concept and approach in mind. Do we get the confirmation where both the S&P and the NASDAQ composite are breaking to a new swing high? If so, conditions are good. The last sign we got along those lines was in February. If not, if we get a non-confirmation, then we can start to dig into things a little bit deeper and look at conditions of breadth and momentum to see if those patterns are still there. The NASDAQ composite as of today has broken to a new swing high for the year. Is that mirrored with the S&P pushing higher as well? I think that's a question that's answered through the course of this week and perhaps into next. Chart number two, Amazon. If we're looking at the uh, consumer discretionary sector, Amazon, obviously one of the biggest weights in the XLY and a uh, widely followed mega cap name. Amazon gapping higher today, up about 3.4%. What's more interesting to me is the fact that we are now above the 200-day moving average. The last couple times we have closed above or traded above the 200-day. Going back the last year and a half, Amazon has failed and come back. Is this time different? Do we have enough upside momentum to push through? If you ask me to pick, I would probably say yes, given the strength that we've seen and the encouraging momentum picture. But let's let price uh, give us that confirmation by getting above and staying above that 200A and pushing to new swing highs as well. Finally, Airbnb, there are things gapping higher like uh, Amazon. There are also things gapping lower. ABNB gapped down about 11%. I think this is one of the names we talked about yesterday with Jay Woods, I want to I want to say. Uh, but we uh, had earnings. It's gapped lower, but right to the 200-day. We opened it just below the 200-day moving average. We closed back above it. If you look, this has happened actually a couple different times where we've trade, traded right down to the 200-day. After first getting above there in January of this year, we've had a couple pullbacks right to that 200-day moving average. Do we uh, hold above there? Do we actually hold that as a support level? I think the price is most important to see if that, uh, that level will hold. Do we hold above the April and February lows as well? Does the momentum stay strong? The RSI is pushing lower down to that crucial 40 level. Price goes down below the 200-day. RSI goes below 40. This chart didn't just gap down. Then all of a sudden, that would look uh, like much further deterioration. So could be an important chart to watch relative to their earnings release, but also relative to some key technical levels. Folks, that is a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Frank Capillary of Cap Thesis going, uh, joining us from New York. All of our previous interviews and a lot of fantastic discussions. More and more from the studio here in Redmond can be found for free at StockChartsTV.com or on our YouTube channel just called Stock Charts. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.